Hello, everyone. I am Kotani from Kyoto University. Today, I'm going to talk about my ongoing research about network access control using workload identity. Let me first briefly introduce myself. My name is Daisuke Kotani, working as an assistant professor at Department of Networking Research Academic Center for Computing and Media Studies at Kyoto University. I'm also teaching students at Graduate School of Informatics. My research interests are programmable networks and network security. If you are interested in my research activities, please visit my website and take a look at academic papers I have published so far. Today, I will mainly talk about network access control lists. Many network devices, such as uh, routers and layer 3 switches, have configured network access control list that is a set of rules used to decide whether to forward a packet or not. In order to use this feature, you need to decide a set of rules that dictates on what conditions a packet is forwarded or not to routers or switches. These rules are usually based on priority, matching conditions of packets and actions, such as allowing a matched packet to be forwarded or not. For example, in this table, the highest priority packet meets the matching conditions of source IP address A, destination IP address B, protocol TCP, and destination port 443, so the packet will be allowed, and other priority packets will be rejected. Under this rule, the orange packet will be forwarded via router, whereas the red packet meets the reject conditions, so it will be blocked by a router. This is how it works. In order to make use of this feature, the first step you need to do is to design a policy for making a set of rules. To design a policy, people usually draw a table like this to evaluate accesses of which source and destination addresses can be allowed or rejected. For example, in the case of TCP 80 of system A, accesses from the internet, department C and D will be allowed, but accesses from other sources will be rejected. Also, a communication between system A and B will be rejected. Likewise, communications between de Department C and D will also be rejected. This is a quick rundown of, rundown of how you design a policy of rulemaking. The next step is to translate this table to a list. You will take advantage of priority, source and destination IP addresses, as well as wildcard to create a set of rules that is efficient and consistent to the table you used before. Once you are done with creating this list, next step is to install the set of rules onto network devices such as routers or layer 3 switches. This step is sometimes automated, but if not, human administrators will do the configuration manually. With that, you've successfully configured the entire process. But when you want to achieve the same thing with a large crowd-based data center, it won't be that easy. Modern large-scale data center networks are typically driven by cloud topology and IP routing, helping data packets find their way to the destination very close to a server. There are servers at the edge in which VMs and containers are elastically created and destroyed according to a system load. This is how the networking usually works. 
a suitable server to run VMs or containers is decided by a controller or orchestrator. IP addresses assigned to each VM and container are based on which server the VM or container is running on, or in other words, the location of the VM or container in the network. I think this is the simplest way. These IP addresses are usually called locator, which is the sole role of IP address in modern data centers. If you try to configure ACL in such a modern data center environment, you will be in a big trouble. One problem is that the number of rules would skyrocket. As I said earlier, IP addresses reflect the location of a server in a network, which means IP addresses are not aggregated by system. For example, in the first table I showed earlier, IP addresses were aggregated to some extent. On the contrary, as you see here, system A and system B uh, do have various different set of IP addresses. Furthermore, suppose the number of VMs or containers changes, whether it be an increase or decrease, the IP address list also needs to be updated accordingly. That means in a case like VMs and containers are frequently updated, ACL also has to be updated frequently. Not only that, it would be also hard to identify an appropriate place to install ACL. The issue of IP address functioning only as a locator is not new. This the problem has been studied for years as an ID and locator separation issue. Possible approaches to this issue include mobile IP, LISP, and HIP. The idea of these approaches was to keep the same ID for a host while changing a locator. But ACLs do not require assigning a same ID to a host. Rather, as VMs and containers are typically short-lived, keeping the same IDs for a host is not necessarily a mandatory in this case. Another approach is to use overlay technology to isolate each system so that it can assign aggregated IP addresses. But this also introduces us a problem of high management overhead. When it comes to managing MAC addresses or IP addresses, you need to manage locator IP addresses in addition to IP addresses used in overlay network. Management overhead will simply double. On top of that, you also have to think about routing between systems. For those reasons, you probably want to avoid this technology if possible. In the current cloud-native landscape, workload identity is generally used for access controls. An open source software project called Spifi defines workload as follows. A workload is a single piece of software deployed with a particular configuration for a single purpose. It basically means a workload encompasses a ra range of different software systems equipped with different functions. Identity, on the other hand, is defined by a dictionary as follows, who a person is or the qualities of a person or group that make them different from others. So what is identity of workload? 
identity of workload represents who owns the workload, which tenant or system owns the workload. Or it could also mean a role in the system, such as application server, database, or key value store, or caching. It also indicates a version of the software or whether it is handling a traffic in development or production environment. As such, you can think of many different attributes for workload identity. If we can take advantage of workload identity for the network ICL, it can help mitigate issues associated with IP addresses and ACL. Spiffy actually leverages workload identity. How does it do it? First, Spiffy provides certificates called SVID to each workload. Then, workload uses SVID to authenticate to other workloads for access control. So you may have already noticed, but application data are authenticated and protected by ML MTLS encryption. But the problem is that part below it, for example, the MTLS processing or TCP IP processing parts cannot be protected by the SPFEEDS approach. So we need to find out a way to protect these below areas. Kubernetes has a network plugin called Cilium. This is actually very interesting. It adopts identity-based con access control model. How does it work? First, when a packet is sent out from a source container, the source container's identity information is embedded in the packet. And at the destination, the source uh, the source container ID and the destination container ID are compared to control access. The project itself is inspiring, but if you want to go further, such as using ACL in the network to block forwarding of a certain packet, you need to have more information embedded in packets. Let's say you want to use this mechanism to control communication with a legacy system. Packets require information of the legacy system. Otherwise, a switch in the middle cannot process the packets. Another case in point is when utilizing a QoS ability. For example, when you want to prioritize production traffic and attach lower priority to traffic in development environment or traffic for batch process, you need to place production traffic information into packets to control. Also, you need to think about how to support virtual machines as they are widely used at data centers. Let me summarize what I have talked about so far. The first point is that in recent cloud network services, IP addresses are not aggregated by a workload identity. They only serve as a locator and hosts are dynamically created and destroyed. As a result, 
at a networking processing in the middle where information embedded in a packet is the only available reference for processing identity of where a packet is coming from or going to is not sufficient enough to complete processing. And there is no viable option available at this stage that can be employed widely at data centers to provide support for virtual machines. Another challenge is that for an approach like SPIFI, which uses a certification to authenticate identity, it is hard to protect packet processing uh, before communication is authenticated or encrypted. To tackle these existing challenges, what we have been working on is to embed more types of workload identities into packets. For example, Selim only had a source identity, but we are adding destination identity to it. By doing so, you will be able to get hold of a source and destination of a traffic enabling many types of processing, such as running ACL process or QoS anywhere in the network. And VM support, that is a tricky issue. One approach we are experimenting is to tap into a process UID to somehow devise information that could be embedded into packets. But a VM administrator is not always the person who administers the overall network. And process UIDs can be modified freely by VM administrator. So we regard process IDs as partial source of trust. That said, there should be opportunities to leverage it. We used to draw this kind of table before that delineates access from which source is allowed or not and what not, and using a set of relevant IP addresses to design rules. But with our current approach, we will be able to assign IDs directly to systems and use the IDs to decide whether a packet can be allowed or not. Also, we expect to write a rich network policy, just like the Kubernetes network policy, to write ACL rules. So our ongoing research is now focusing on producing this type of ACL rule policy similar to Kubernetes. Before going into the next slide, let me first define two terms. The one is service. In my presentation, I use service as a set of workloads that can be treated in the same way. And another term is service access control ID or Sakura ID, which is an identifier assigned to each service. So currently, we are developing a system called Asilla. So this is a prototype system to manage network ACLs on a DC-wide basis and uh, by managing the identity of workloads. In developing this, we ran into many issues. For instance, where should we get the identities of workloads? Where should we process the packets? because we want to avoid changes inside the VMs and containers as much as possible. So in this limitation, what can we do? Or how should we uh, generate SACL IDs? And what should we do with packet formats when we embed them? Uh, how will this impact network performance? These are some of the issues that we needed to face. So let me go into each of these issues. 
So the first is uh, where to receive the source of identity information. So this is pretty straightforward. Data centers, for instance, VMs and containers, they have managers called controllers. For instance, Kubernetes, an environment with Kubernetes, Kubernetes controllers have information of what kind of containers are available in the data center. If it's for VMs, OpenStack controllers have information of what kind of VMs are available. or who the owner of the VM is. So all of these informations are available in the controller. So we retrieve those data and embed that into a scylla so that we have information about the workload uh, and the type of identities that exist. For legacy systems, there are no such controllers that have aggregated data. In that situation, this, uh, system admins must manually add this information. The next question is where to process the packets. So where to embed the end identifier. So what we need to consider here is any places that the user have direct access uh, cannot be fully trusted by system admins. For instance, here, the VMs, containers, and legacy systems cannot be fully trusted because users can maliciously alter something, or it can be hacked, and there may be some changes made by external sources. So in this dark blue area is where only the system admins have access. So we will place a scylla between the dark blue and the light blue areas. And we will do some kind of process in between these two areas. And then we can embed the identifiers here. But in this case, If someone wants to use a process UID and assign a different identifier based on these UIDs, they will not be able to do so in this system. So in that case, a user must install an agent in the VM so that uh, they can mark packets according to process UID. The Scylla will take that to convert that to an ID that can be used system-wide. So where to apply ACLs? This can be applied anywhere. However, for us, we decided uh, the destination node as our first target. So other places, such as the source workload or in between networks are also other options that are possible. However, we thought that there would be a lot of destination workloads. And if we were to update rules for each destination workload, then that will uh, leave some error room for errors. And latency, delay, and update can also result in people accessing the destination workload who does not have permission to do so. So we decided uh, to apply this in the destination node as our first target. Of course, applying this in the source or doing it within the network can also reduce the overall uh, network cost. So this is something we can consider in the future. So now let's going on to uh, SACL ID generation. There are four types of information that a scylla receives. So data from Kubernetes controllers, data from VM controllers, 
On top of that, there are server information. And finally, uh, policies to set ACLs. So Acilla will take Kubernetes and VM control uh, data from Kubernetes and VM controllers. So they will use IP address, interface, and UID information. And they will assign that as a label. For this label, they will assign a SACL ID. So something to remember here is the data that comes from the Kubernetes and VM controllers come to the Acela automatically. So the system admins uh, do not need to do anything here. When the Acela controller has these two types of data, like for instance, the pod's IP address, the interface, and the UID, they can take those uh, data and convert that to a SACL ID. Also, based on each UID, they can also create a local ID per VM. Also, users will enter policies. Based on these policies, we can create pairs of our source SACL ID and destination uh, SACL ID to grant or not grant access. So the next step is to embed these into packets or use it for uh, packet filtering. And we can do this in various places again. So and when embedding this information into packets, uh, you can install an agent in VM. Uh, you could create a, a local, a temporary local ID from process UIDs and embed that into packets. We will do that in the VM. The source node that receives this will use source IP, ingress interface, and local ID information to generate a source SACL ID and embed that into the packet. At the same time, they will take destination IP address and destination port information to create a destination SACL ID and embed that into the packet. So this is the current implementation. However, in the future, we will also want to embed more types of data and information. So we're talking about ingress interface here. And part of Kubernetes uh, components put a NAT on destination notes. So we can also put information of IP addresses before they were NAT. Then when applying rules, where should we do this? This can be done anywhere, but we should apply these rules when they are actually used. In our case, our first target is to uh, apply the rules on destination nodes. We will first distribute to the destination node and, and write uh, the process in BPF. So in terms of packet format, there are two requirements here. Number one, it should not interfere with current IP routing. Number two, uh, we should be able to apply ACL at both source and destination nodes and networking devices. So for all packets, uh, source and destination source SACL IDs must be embedded. So there are two choices of locations. So in an environment with only IPv6, we can use a hop-by-hop 
option. We can add this option. If we also need to consider IPv4 packets, and we can use SRV6. SRV6 has a TLV field, and we can insert this information there. I will go into more details in the following slides. And SACL IDs are currently 64-bit. I understand this is quite lengthy, but we are also considering uh, possibilities for future extensions. So if we take the hop-by-hop hop option, uh, this is pretty straightforward. In the IPv6 option header, uh, we can define the Acilla header. What's included here are the source SACL ID and destination SACL ID, both in 64-bit. So going on to SRV6 TLV, in this environment that uses SRV6, segment routing header uh, is added to the IPv6 header. And this is what this header looks like. So the segment list uh, provides where this information, which router and link it, this information goes through. In this list, we can add an optional type length value object. In here, we can embed information that we use by Acilla. We've also conducted a preliminary evaluation on performance. Source and destination nodes may have many entries or a chart. So this is our assumption. So currently, we use eBPF. If we add many entries to the EPPF map, what are the impact to network performance? And so we did an evaluation on this. So this is the environment of this validation process. We have two servers. We have one switch. And they're connected in 100 gigabps. EBPF program is attached by FTC. Packet length is 1,000 bytes. Each entry map is 64-bit key and with a 32-bit value. So this is the result that you can see in this chart. As you can see, the number of entries did not have an impact on throughput. Actually, referencing to the map, of course, the performance will deteriorate, which was assumed. Uh, we were able to achieve 70 gigabps without eBPF programs. Even with a lot of entries, we were still able to maintain 70 gigabps. So we can conclude that the number of entries uh, does not impact the overhead on the overall performance. So when we look at the actual environment that uses Acilla, we are not expecting a lot of lookups. We're assuming maybe 10 times per packet. And the number of entries on this chart it has up to you know, 50 million entries. However, I believe that the average will be less than 10K. If we look at the source node, there are 20 VMs or containers in the source node, which are being accessed by 15 services on average each service consisting of 10 pods. In this situation, this will result in about 3,000 entries. If we look at the destination node, say that there are 20 services, and they're being accessed by an average of maybe 15 services, that will result in 300 entries. So. We can continue to optimize on how to create entries by improving SQL ID generation methods. So this was a brief a summary of my presentation. So IB addresses 
are not aggregate per identity of workload in recent DCNs. So we cannot use a network ACLs in these situations. With this background, we are developing a system called Asilla, which is a prototype system to manage network ACLs at DCY by using uh, identity of workloads. So this research has just begun. And uh, we will like to continue experimenting many things. Details of this research will be presented at IEICEIA's fifth meeting on December 15th. If you are interested, uh, please join us for this uh, presentation. Also, I would like to send my special thanks to the members of Line Verda office. Line Verda is a private cloud run on the Line platform. I would like to thank them for their contribution to this research. Also, I would like to extend my thanks to a master student in our lab, Kentaro Onishi, who helped me with the research and implementation. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much.